ships are designed not to sink. I know, amazing isn't it? That's the kind of quality insight you all subscribe for. When you're on a ship as a passenger, it's a comforting thought, but when you're a planner for creating an artificial reef, it presents some serious challenges. Right now, as I record this video, the great SS United States is being prepared to be sunk and become one of the world's largest artificial reefs. The idea is she'll become something of a dive hotspot, a tourist destination for talented technical divers, but in order to become a functional dive destination, SS US will need to be sunk here off Okaloosa County, Florida, where the depth is fairly shallow, about 180 feet. So here's the issue. Ships that sink in shallow waters typically roll over as they go, thanks to a whole host of things we'll get into in a minute. It means if improperly prepared, the ship could sink onto its side, a situation that will speed up collapse and decay. Or worst of all, totally upside down, kind of killing the fun dive tourism vibe. So just how do you prepare a ship to sink well, to sink in just the way you need it to so that people can enjoy it for decades to come? Well, there are a few important steps along the way. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is how you sink a ship on purpose. So first of all, why sink a ship at all? It seems insanely wasteful. I mean, how many countless hundreds of thousands of hours go into designing, building, and operating big ships, right? Well, the thing is though, ships eventually outlive their operational usefulness, and there's only so much you can do with them. Some lucky ones are kept on as hotels or museum ships for display, but even they need constant, unrelenting maintenance to keep pretty. Others are recycled at the scrapyard or sent for razor blades, as the old saying goes. But some get a really unique end, intentional sinking. The artificial reef is a clever concept that essentially uses a sunken ship to encourage marine growth and a habitat for marine creatures. The ship's structure becomes the basis for soft and stony corals to grow on. This in turn attracts local wildlife which live in this kind of environment. Now aside from providing a large shelter for marine creatures, artificial reefs also create attractive spots for recreational and commercial fishermen, since schools of fish will naturally flock to the area to feed and live. Then of course there are the divers who visit sites around the world to explore underwater. This kind of underwater tourism can bring a huge boost to small coastal areas that might otherwise not have a strong influx of visitors. One of the first ships to be sunk intentionally to become an artificial reef was the US Coast Guard cutter Duane, sunk off the Florida Keys in 1987 after half a century of service. Some might see the sinking of a vaunted ship like this as a kind of death, others with a sense of humour simply say that Duane has been reassigned. The latter is kind of true. Duane is playing an important role today, providing a home for a rich variety of marine wildlife and an exciting place for divers to explore. But sinking a ship isn't actually as easy as it sounds. I mean, yeah, you could just pop a few holes in it and it would sink, but there's more to it than that. I mentioned that ships have a tendency to roll on their sides as they go under. Even with holes punched in the hull symmetrically on either side, a ship might still roll and capsize. It's down to the fact that many, if not most ships, aren't designed symmetrically inside. The corridors, hatches and scuttles present on the port side might not have a twin on the starboard side and vice versa. As the ship takes on water, one side will naturally flood faster than the other, creating a list and eventually a roll. Interestingly, this actually wouldn't be an issue in deeper water. Plenty of ships have rolled at the surface only to land upright on the ocean floor below. It's because of the shape of the hull and all the weight down below. It's designed to keep the ship upright, so as the vessel drops, the hydrodynamic forces will act on the hull and it'll flip itself upright. This happened to the battleship Bismarck, for example. But if the water isn't deep enough for the ship to self-right, it'll just land on its side, like the Lusitania, Britannic, and Andrea Doria, or upside down, like the battleship Scharnhorst. Now, going to the effort of procuring a decommissioned ship, rigging it to sink, and then sending it down is expensive, as we'll soon see, and time consuming. So you can only imagine how disappointing it would be for the thing to land the wrong way up. Few divers, I imagine, would be interested in swimming up and down a few hundred feet of hull plating. So the challenge is for crews to sink a ship just the right way. But before they can even get there, they need to clean the thing 
first. The ship is stripped of any and all hazards that might impact life below. By their very nature, ships employ some pretty nasty stuff like chemicals, lubricating oils, fuel, cleaning agents, hydraulic fluids, and many, many more. It all has to be flushed out and thoroughly inspected, the effort all the while being coordinated with local environmental agencies. Sunken ships have been the cause of some horrendous ecological disasters, like the Exxon Valdez. So intentionally sinking a ship starts by removing any possibility of anything remotely like this. After all, the intention is to create a welcoming home for fish and animals, not something that will kill them. It's a serious job too, oil and fuel isn't easy to clean out. To this day, 84 years after having been sunk at Pearl Harbor, USS Arizona still leaks oil into the sea. The United States EPA actually has a pretty impressive handbook on just how to prepare a decommissioned ship like this. Workers need to deal with oil and fuel, asbestos, PCBs or synthetics on ships built before the 80s, paint like antifoul which is toxic to marine growth, and loose debris like plastics and flaking paint chips, basically anything that might float out. Obviously the bigger the ship, the harder this is to do. Remember when I said this could be expensive? Well, in 2006, the old World War II carrier, USS Oriskany, was reefed. All up, it took an entire year just to prepare the ship for sinking and it cost upward of $15 million, with nearly $4 million spent on environmental risk assessment alone. This stuff is no joke. A Naval Sea Systems Command report outlined all the work done to Oriskany. The scope of work included the removal and disposal of all liquid hydrocarbons like fuel and oil, so that she was essentially petroleum free, the removal of asbestos, capacitors, transformers, liquid PCB containing components, sweep up and disposal of all loose paint accumulated on all the deck surfaces, removal and disposal of all trash, loose debris, cleaning materials, batteries, mercury, antifreeze, coolants, fire extinguishing agents, black and gray water, and chromated ballast water. It's a mind blowing amount of work and a huge amount of consideration just to send a ship down below. Sinking the United States, for example, is probably going to cost somewhere around $10 million. So with all the diesel, kerosene, asbestos, grease, petroleum, lubricating and systems oils scrubbed and cleaned from the ship's tanks, holds, bilge, engine rooms, pressure lines, storage compartments, yada yada, attention has to be turned to actually sinking it. Now, as you know, getting it wrong could mean a capsize, so a thorough study is done on the vessel's stability plan is put into place to minimize topside weight. Reducing top heaviness will have a huge impact on the way the ship sinks and it vastly reduces the risk of capsize. Anything heavy up top is stripped away, usually davits, the lifeboats, ventilating fans, and in the case of the SS United States, her towering funnels and radar mast. Torches will cut away at all of this and soon the ship might just be reduced to a kind of sad looking hulk but at least it's less likely to roll over. Another way to reduce the risk of capsizing is to get the ship down quickly to avoid the buildup of air pockets that might make it linger on the surface in a kind of compromised state of buoyancy. Windows and portholes are removed intact, not smashed out because that would only create more work and more hazards. They're removed nearly entirely to allow water to rush in evenly along the hull and the superstructure and critically to allow air to escape as quickly as possible as the ship goes. Next, the torches are turned on the ship's hull itself. To help remove the risk of uneven flooding and to ensure water can get in and air can escape, holes are cut strategically along the hull. Planners will work with the ship's blueprints to ensure that if, say for example, there's a long corridor on one side of the ship and the other side is divided instead into several compartments, these will have cuts in them in the hull to make sure they can flood as evenly as the corridor on the other side where the inrush of water is uninterrupted. But planners also need to think about how the ship will work once it's actually reassigned below the surface. Divers will need to be able to get inside and find their way around safely, so to help out hatches and doorways are removed where it's thought that divers might like to visit, especially topside, but conversely in restricted or disorienting spaces like the boiler and engine rooms, hatches might be sealed instead to prevent divers from entering and becoming lost. Sharp corners are cut out and some hatches and doorways are cut as well to be widened to make it easier for underwater navigation. So with all of that done, 
All the holes cut in, the windows removed, and the ship essentially a hulk, ready to drop like a stone, the big day comes. Towed into position, the ship might be anchored in place, where crews can open the sea cocks or valves that let water into the hull, but more usually, small explosive charges can be detonated along the length to blast holes into the shell plating. The water rushes in, roars in through the open compartments, pours in through the empty portholes and windows, with all the excess weight removed topside, the ship should sink down straight as an arrow, with a hiss and a whoosh of white spray at the surface. If the cleanup crew has done their job right, there shouldn't be an oil slick on the surface either. It's a surprisingly time-consuming process to sink a ship the right way, but the rewards can be great. Ships that are scrapped are gone forever, but ships that are sunk live on in a kind of philosophical way. Many people are upset that the SS United States is going to be sunk, myself included. I mean, how could I not be? But the truth is, she will go on to do an important job for the next few decades. Eventually though, as with all underwater wrecks, she will decay and collapse. Artificial reefs only exist temporarily as dive spots. Eventually, the underwater corrosion will create structural concerns that will make it dangerous for divers to even approach. But at least she's avoiding the scrapper's torch. And for the foreseeable future, the Big U will serve as the world's largest artificial reef. It's the first record she'll have broken since her speed record back in the summer of 1953. So that's how you sink a ship on purpose. Most of your time will be spent on cleanup, most of your money too apparently, and the actual sinking will only take a few minutes, but the benefits could be huge. Millions of dollars in tourist spending for local communities, healthy catches for fishermen, but perhaps nobody will benefit quite as much from the SS United States sinking as the red snapper, tuna and mackerel that will soon become a permanent residence. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.